number 10, Blinded by Ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens lists is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel is Corset poke off, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks, that should be a musical, not Frozen. Get out of here. At number eight, no side bays. A bad relationship can really mess you up. Anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that. Not as many people carry that pain with them as much as Catherine de Medici did back in the day. Hurt didn't even begin to describe how she felt, and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken. She basically turned into the type of person that was like, if I'm not happy, no one else is gonna be happy either. Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband though, Catherine Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven, party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now, lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready. They're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Kings like that actually existed. They were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus, they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like, a zoo? You couldn't find a more romantic place? Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC? 
His final days were spent partying and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. Number five, George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word, philately. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it, yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kinda just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy, because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair, and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too. Check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now, born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also, so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. 
horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason, and like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. Yeah. At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day. And if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally like fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built, so he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery, just standing there just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrinstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. Number 10 in our countdown is Julia Get a Grip Agrippina. When the Emperor Claudius' wife, Melissiana, became entangled in an adultery scandal, the power position of the Roman Empress was suddenly wide open in the year 49. Julia Agrippina, exiled for a conspiracy against her first husband and widowed from her second that she was believed to have poisoned, concocted a scheme. In an outrageous maneuver, she seduced her own uncle Claudius to become his fourth wife. She didn't stop there, however. She then had her uncle husband make the son she had had in her prior marriage, Nero, his heir by marrying him to his own daughter from his previous marriage. Ooh, now that's that's quite a family tree. Taking the title Augusta, she maintained a stronghold over political and household affairs, considering herself a co-ruler to her husband. After Claudius died from eating poisoned food, which is how her prior husband died, so make the connection there, Nero became a Roman emperor and would forever change Roman history in his time of rule. However, Agrippina could only hover above her son for so long, and his annoyance of her invasiveness grew. Nero chose to assassinate his mother with a trap, a boat set forth on the Bay of Naples designed to sink. But when it did, she swam ashore. Nero changed his plans and had his soldiers invade her summer home to do the deed instead. Number 9 in our countdown may be one of our most badass queens, Empress Theodora, from street busker to top dog. Syrian born Theodora starts her journey as an actress, dancer, and mime alongside her two sisters in the late 400s, something she abandons by age 16 to be a mistress to a Syrian official. And she travels much of North Africa with him before his maltreatment and temper made her settle down in Egypt alone, where she took up wool spinning. It was here she met Emperor Justinian and the two fell in love. And after Justinian changed some laws so that they could marry, they began co-ruling the Bayezidine Empire together. So what made her mad, you may ask? Her ideals and the smearing that they led to through history. She was historically known for supporting religious freedoms, women's rights, and the education of the masses. Her decisions, which reflected her opinions, led to the Nicaea riots of Constantinople. She intervened and was able to persuade her husband to stay. The two successfully quelled the revolt 
and in turn, she made Constantinople one of the most sophisticated cities in the world and promoted women's equity. Theodora's name appears in almost all the legislation passed during the period, and she received foreign envoys and correspondence with foreign rulers. Her husband died in 1527 AD, and Theodora took sole control of the Roman Empire. Under her reign, bridges, aqueducts, and churches were built. Theodora died of cancer on June 28, 548 AD. She and Justinian are both considered saints by the Eastern Orthodox Church. The She Wolf of France is in number 8 of our countdown. Her actual name is Queen Isabella of England, and she was famously married to the closeted Edward II. Acting as a beard to someone who doesn't love you would be hard enough, but the two did also have to produce heirs together. One would be the future King Edward III. Queen Isabella was in a desolate and lonely situation, especially as her husband's two male suitors, Piers Gaveston, who he gifted her jewels to, and Hugh Dispenser, who was a wildly hated extortionist, were always his preferred company. So she rounded up some spiteful nobles, first killing Gaveston by beheading, and then driving Dispenser from the country and redistributing his wealth. King Edward unsurprisingly was upset and sieged against those who had contributed to the death and exile of his lovers, all whilst his wife took cover in the Tower of London. It's here she met exiled British traitor Lord Roger Mortimer and started her own affair. She had him broken out and sent to France where she later joined him and with her son and then sent Edward a letter that essentially said, suck it. The anger at having been cast aside turned into burning desire for vengeance as Isabella invaded England with her new husband and army and upsurped the throne where she and Mortimer then ruled until her son came of age and had her dethroned for her violent tendencies. She died 28 years later in retirement and Edward III later went on to rule England for 50 remarkable years. Number 7. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider Man guy. That's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so. So for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standard, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war, and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs, and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned, like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just, you know, marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her away. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad 
She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Home, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chilonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chalones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the T on that? Chilonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you, or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chimay. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back 
A wife. Carry on. Also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. At number 10, some background. The Mughal dynasty in India was founded by Babur, a descendant of the one, the only, Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. After he defeated a sultan of Delhi named Ibrahim Lodi in 1526, Babur was the first step in the Mughal dynasty that would last for over three centuries. To say that the empire was immense is an understatement. The empire ruled over 103 million people, probably even more. The Mughals were rooted in Muslim beliefs and were noted for their well-organized government and cultural sophistication. Many of the rulers tried to integrate the Hindus and Muslims under one state, but as we will find out from this list, it was not an easy thing to do, which ended up causing a lot of strife. Many rulers of the empire flip-flopped back and forth between being merciful and tyrannical towards the Hindus, adding to centuries of oppression. At number 9, Blinded. Humayun was set to inherit the throne from his father, much to the jealousy of his brothers. He was 23 when he ascended the throne in 1530 after the death of his father. His brothers reigned over different fiefs, but none of them were satisfied unless they had the crown. He also wasn't the best ruler. Humayun was sent into exile for 15 years after he was overthrown by one of his father's generals, Sher Shah. Humayun fled and eventually ended up in Persia where he built back up an army through his partnership with the Shah. Slowly, he took back his land, facing his own brothers who were constantly scheming against him. But Babur, his father, made him promise that he would never lay a hand on his brothers. But his brother Kamran continued to threaten him, and one instance while defending a fort turned on the innocents trapped inside and took their lives viciously. Kamran, not a good dude. Something needed to be done. He eventually catches his scheming brothers, blinds his brother Kamran, and chains his brother Askari. A little messed up, but like, you know, not bad for war. Before I carry on with the rest of the video, make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel and maybe consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far. At number 8, Akbar. Humayun continued to deal with the competition of his brothers until finally his reign came to an end, but not in the way that you would expect. He was carrying a bunch of books up some stairs and he accidentally fell, leading to a lethal head injury. His 13 year old son Akbar had to inherit the throne. Akbar would later become known as the Great, but that doesn't mean that he didn't do some questionable things. Where his father failed to conquer, Akbar swept through. But just like his father, he encountered jealousy and dangerous ambition in the dark corners of his reign. In Delhi, an attempt to assassinate him was made, the bowman nearly missing him. Who was behind it? The slave of a nobleman who recently tried to start a rebellion. But the plot thickens. Akbar's foster brother's mother had further designs to establish power for herself through her son, Adam Khan. Khan actually ended up taking the life of Akbar's foster father, which led to Akbar throwing him down the stairs and therefore killing him. The mother died 40 days later due to grief. Grief over her son or the loss of power? Who knows? Maria the Mad comes in at number 7 of our countdown. She was just 16 years old when she became the Princess of Brazil and the Duchess of Braxana, then their queen following the passing of her father. Brazil changed from just a Portuguese colony to a large kingdom. Brazil, the Algraves, and the United Kingdom of Portugal are three famous formations recorded under Maria the Mad and her son. After the death of the queen's husband uncle in 1786, however, there was a noticeable decline in her mental health. 1788 saw the passing of her daughter, newborn son, and her her closest confidant. By 1792, after the passing of her eldest son a year prior, Maria seemed to be experiencing a combined symptoms of hallucinations, depression, and anxiety, all resulting from mass traumatic losses. It evolved to later include religious mania and melancholia. She started avoiding court gatherings and social or royal obligation. It was then her treatment went to Dr. Francis Willis, who tried straitjacketing, blistering, and ice baths, none of which were helpful for obvious reasons. After treatment, for more than five years, he declared the disease was incurable. By 1792, Maria was no longer a capable ruler and deemed insane. Courts pushed her son John to take over the government ruling, but he delayed until he finally took the throne in 1799 for a truly tragic reason. There was just no longer any possibility that his mother would ever recover her senses. If the nickname Maria the Mad wasn't already taken, then this next Maria named Monarch would have snatched it up. In at number six is Maria Eleonora of Bradenburg. Maria Eleonora was born in 
1699 to Prince of Bradenburg and Anna, Duchess of Prussia. She grew up pampered, and Maria Eleonora was the it girl of the 17th century. All powerful monarchs fell over themselves to marry her. While she was dismissive of the 22 year old Swedish King Gustav Adolphus initially, in 1620 she changed her tune as she had apparently fallen in love with him practically overnight. And so they were married. With the king so frequently risking his life in battle, it became imperative that his wife produce a male heir. So Maria had to hanker down and focus on the baby making business. Maria experienced three stillborn children consecutively before the successful birth of her daughter in 1626. It was a rare break in battle, so her husband was there to excitedly greet his daughter. Maria, however, had a very different response. Her baby was born with the condition fleece lanugo, a condition where hair covers the body of a newborn. Her infant was enveloped from its head to its knees, leaving only its face, arms, and lower legs visible. Maria was horrified, claiming to have birthed a demon, and rejected her daughter for the decade to come, even after losing her husband in 1632 Battle of Lutzen. And while everyone mourns their own way, it's easy to say Maria really took it up a notch. She forced their daughter to sleep in blacked out rooms and reportedly hung King Gustav's heart in a golden casket on the ceiling above the bed, making the girl sleep directly under her father's blessed remains. In 1633, Maria Eleonora returned to Sweden with her beloved's embalmed body. She refused to bury Gustav for more than a year, reportedly embracing and caressing the decomposing king. Maria's story continues to become more demented with time and her daughter grows to become her caretaker, especially when troublesome Maria runs away to Denmark permanently and her daughter's left to become the queen and pay her mom's allowance to Danish royals. Awkward. Number 5 may have not gone mad, but it was her favorite emotion, Empress Anna of Russia. She is remembered as a horrible and spiteful child with a cruelty streak. Young Anna it was reported to be mannerless and vulgar. So when her father, who experienced a stroke shortly after her birth that left him handicapped, passed away, her very traditional mother attempted to raise her in classic elements of strict religious femininity, so she may be a quiet and obedient woman. Anna had other plans. She hunted animals, kept guns and swords, and terrorized other children as well as the commoners. This behavior was all a massive red flag for some of the crazy things she'd do later in life when granted power and the means. Anna's only husband ever was Frederick Williams, who at their reception indulged a little too heavy on alcohol and gave him a hangover so wicked that three days later he just died. In 1730, her uncle Peter the Great passed. The Privy Council turned her into the Empress of all of Russia since she was widowed and childless, which was assumed to cause less trouble. The joke's on them because she turned around and immediately abolished the Supreme Privy Council and re-established the autocracy. Now she had the sole power, and while she made some serious political waves, Anna also made some strange choices. She has a serious vendetta with Peter the Great's daughter Elizabeth, her cousin. Elizabeth was a better looking, younger, and also a rival for her throne. So she ruined her life. No nobleman could marry Elizabeth. If Elizabeth chose a commoner, the empress would strip her of her titles and her claim to the throne. When Anna found out about Elizabeth's side piece, the unhinged empress ordered her men to cut out his tongue and exiled him to Serbia. Anna even woke up one morning and decided to force Prince Mikhail to marry her lower class older maid as a joke. After the ceremony wrapped up, Anna placed the prince, Mikhail, and the maid in a cage, dressed them as clowns, and paraded them on top of an elephant to an ice palace she had constructed for their honeymoon. In the extreme cold of Russia, she reportedly advised them to get to doing the dirty with each other if they wanted to keep their bodies warm enough to stay alive. Maria Eleonora wasn't the only queen who couldn't give up on a dead relationship, pun intended. Number 4 is Joanna of Castile. Never meant to be a princess, let alone a queen, Joanna earned her title and nickname Joanna La Loca through unfortunate means. She had two older siblings, Isabella who passed in 1498 and Joan in 1497. Joanna's mother, the formidable Catholic monarch Isabella I of Castile, passed away in 1504. This left the throne to, of Castile and Lyon to Joanna when her father passed in 1517. Joanna had started exhibiting signs of mental instability in 1504 when her mother had been sick. She was struggling to eat or sleep and having outbursts of anger. One such example was when she wished to go see her husband in Flanders, the journey would take her through France, which Castile were at war with at the time. When she was prevented from leading for Flanders, 24 year old Joanna flew into a rage. Perhaps one of Joanna's most notable displays of mental instability occurred when her husband died in 1506. Joanna refused to part with her deceased husband's remains for a disturbingly long time, reportedly opening the casket to kiss or embrace him. I'm seeing a pattern here with some of these women. While pregnant, Joanna traveled with her husband's body from Burgos to Granada, a distance of 668 kilometers, which would take around six and a half hours to drive in a car today. And talk about a romantic imbalance, while she did all of this posthumously, when her husband Philip was alive, he sh 
talk Juana's madness to anyone that would listen and completely discredited the woman. In 1509, Juana was placed in the royal monastery slash covenant of Santa Clara and Tostillas, Castile, by her son Charles, who also forbade Juana to have any visitors until her passing. The most recognizable name on our list is Marie Antoinette, who is number three in our countdown. Married at only 14, Marie was known to have lived an opulent lifestyle, but there was a lot of conspiracy and debate about the young woman. She was performing what she knew her royal duties to be, and she was known for not always being the most educated. She started the trend of riding donkeys and the worldwide trend of feathered slash stuffed bird hats. She even once had an entire miniature village created with functioning shops so that she and other elites may dress like commoners and experience living lower status. Marie was misguided and young, but she was also the victim of an incredible smear campaign. She was accused of having ulterior motives constantly, supplying the Austrians with military plans or siphoning millions of livres of treasury money to Austria. It was the tales of sexual deviance that were the most damaging though. Alleged to have had orgies, laid with commoners, or even have sex with her own ladies in waiting. Her most offensive accusal was thrown at her in trial before her famous decapitation where she was accused of committing indiscretions with her own child Louise Charles. With such a vast array of accusations against her, not one of which was supported by any concrete evidence, the trial was a formality, conceived merely as a step towards completing the revolution. Marie Antoinette was declared guilty and executed only hours later at the age of 37. Speaking of sexual deviance, meet Queen Anna Nzinga, who is number two in our countdown. Queen of what's now known as present day Angola, Anna took the crown when her brother passed away. Being queen of Angola was hard work. Anna managed to keep the Portuguese invaders out for over 40 years alone. So how would you, a tough and titanous queen, decompress? Why by building a harem, of course. Anna collected the men she found to be the most attractive warriors in her region, keeping a harem of 50 to 60 men close at hand for whenever she, well, wanted a romp in the sack. Spending a great deal of her time strategizing her on battlefield in men's apparel, some historians wonder if that's why she required the men in her harem to dress as women. Now Anna didn't have time to deal with picking who she was going to sleep with every night, so she devised a unique system. Anna would just have the two men who desired her the most that evening fight to the death every night and then bed the winner. The next day, the winner still loses as she would have them executed. Anna disbanded her harem at 75 when she took on her teenage husband, cementing her status as not only a serious badass who liberated her people and established dominance in an era of men, but also as a cougar. The next queen fought her way to the top of the countdown. Number one is Queen Rananavola the first. During her reign of Madagascar, Queen Rananavola the first is remembered as a dangerous tyrant who ruled her island nation with cruelty and an iron fist. Rananavola was a merciless to those who tried to colonize her nation, but also to those inhabiting it. Should crimes, disputes, or discourse arise, Rananavola had a nifty trick to solve it called trial by ordeal. Both parties would be forced to ingest three pieces of chicken skin alongside a poison taken from a native plant, Tangena. Throw up your chicken skins and you're proclaimed innocent. Hooray! If you didn't, you were guilty and to be put to death if the poison didn't kill you first. This trial was one of the punishments used in her persecution of Christian colonists alongside throwing people into rock quarries and live dismemberments. Her horrific list really will go on. Rana Lavona was such a deadly tyrant that the queen managed to reduce her country's population from 5 million people in 1833 to 2.5 million in 1839, all through means of war, executions, religious persecution, or just settling scores. Depicted as a deranged tyrant even after her death in 1861, many have tried to repaint her image as one of a driven ruler trying to keep her culture and country independent from those trying to grow their own selfish empires. What's your take? Number 10, King Charles I. You can put any king down on this list, really. Uh, people weren't as kind and loving as we are now. Or, or well, less cruel, I guess. <laughs> king Charles was no different from any other. A monarch sniffing his own farts up in his castle, doing his very best to snuff out religious groups that he didn't agree with. A lot of guys were like that. It's brutal, but that's history, folks. Well, one such measure he took, I think, was so wrong, so heinous, and so criminal, and so offensive, that he should have been locked up for life. During the 1600s, this man, in an effort to curb religious views, outlawed Christmas. Yeah, that's right. Outlawed Christmas. That means no gifts, no tree, no Santa Claus, no turkey, no stuffing, no nothing. This was quickly dissolved after he was removed from office. And yes, I know Santa Claus wasn't there then, but st it's still, it's Santa Claus, it's Christmas. Can't have Christmas without Santa Claus. Number nine, William the Conqueror. You've all probably heard the name William the Conqueror. Battle of Hastings, illegitimate son of the king fighting for the throne, very violently too, I might add. 
However, today I want to talk about his dating skills. Look, dating can be hard. I, I, I get that. There's a lot of anxiety, especially when self-image comes into play. Ooh, I'm too fat. I hate my nose. And what are these legs? Ugh, no one's gonna like me. Everyone thinks like that. And it's always usually right before a date, too. You could be staring in the mirror and then all of a sudden all your bruises, pimples, and blemishes seem to show up out of nowhere. It's weird how that works. Well, William was different though. He, he was more confident. He didn't have confidence issues like the rest of us. To quote a brilliant chemist, he was the one who knocks. As the story goes, he was quite fond of one lass. She was not fond of him. Classic story, really. So after trying to court her several times and failing, he decided to drag her on the ground by her hair until she said yes. Don't, don't do that, that's, that's bad. Number eight, Kangas Khan. I don't think some folks realize just how brutal this guy really was. I mean, if you've ever played the Ghost of Tsushima game on PlayStation, then you know exactly what the Mongol horde is capable of. Nasty things. The man carved out most of Asia and parts of Europe. In one battle allegedly, taking the lives of one million people. And all that remained was a mountain of bones and human fat. Ooh, gross. He's been known on how not to treat a lady and reportedly liked to use his young and newest soldiers as arrow fodder by creating human shields with them. A lot of conscripts in his army were often taken from villages that he conquered. It's kind of how he kept the machine going. So either fight with me or that's picture app for you. What a nice guy. What a swell nice guy. Jeez. At number seven, Jahangir. So this guy was super impatient to become the ruler and was getting tired of Daddy Akbar taking his time. So he revolted. Damn, this court honestly was just rife with rebellion. They never got tired of it. In 1599, while his father was otherwise engaged and away from the palace, Prince Salim led a revolt. During the revolt, he even skinned a man alive. Akbar was pissed about this and wrote to his son and said, quote, I have never skinned a bird alive in my life and you have treated a human being in this manner. Jahangir then went on to conspire against a close advisor of his father named Abul Fazl, whom Jahangir killed in a small battle. Despite Akbar being devastated at his son's behavior, he was only male heir left to inherit, so on Akbar's deathbed, he forgave his son and implored the nobles to recognize him as a leader. At number six, so to an ox. Now Jahangir was emperor, but the trouble didn't stop there. I saw some sources recognize him as a somewhat benevolent figure, while others said that he was the exact opposite. He was pretty brutal, and his first task was crushing a rebellion against that which his own son began. Apple, not far from the tree. He was traveling to Lahore when he came across two nobles who were sympathetic to his son's cause. So he decided to punish them in a very peculiar and violent way. He ordered that one be sewed to the skin of an ass and the other to an ox. Now that is messed up. When he got to Lahore to face the rebels, he crushed them and blinded his own son as punishment. A ruler couldn't have any impediments, so therefore his son could no longer pursue the role. Then he hung his son's followers outside of Taksali Gate. Yeah, so even within the confines of war, this guy had some pretty messed up ideas. At number five, the horse and his boy. On the less violent end of the spectrum, Jahangir was actually a big fan of the arts, science, and worldly things. Unlike his father who couldn't read and write, an interesting skill for a ruler not to have, Jahangir was all about it. He really wasn't interested in military, which was a task he left to his son. But he did inherit his father's wealth, and considering he wasn't working in the military, he had time to indulge his curiosity. In his memoirs, there are fantastic paintings of exotic animals. There's a painting of a zebra that has a very funny story behind it. The zebra was being taken as a gift to the Shafavid Shah, and it was traveling through the port of the empire. Jahangir heard about it and had it brought to court first, and didn't believe that it was real. He thought that it was a painted horse, so he had people try and wash them off. Only when the paint didn't come off, did he realize his mistake and ordered that the wondrous creature be painted. At number four, Shah Jahan and the Taj Mahal. Okay, so this one isn't messed up for violence or anything, but it is the ultimate love story and we just can't leave it off this list. There is one part that is messed up to me because man, I don't even know, but 
you will get to that. If you've ever been to India, then one of the stops you made on your trips was probably to the Taj Mahal, a breathtaking mausoleum built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to commemorate the love of his life. Considering how big and intricate it is, you know that their love was bigger than any storybook. An Indian poet called the Taj Mahal a teardrop on the cheek of time, a testament to grief and power. Mumtaz Mahal was Shah Jahan's favorite wife, forsaking all of his other wives just to be with her. They went everywhere together, even on military missions. This is where, from my perspective, where things get crazy. This woman delivered 14 children for her husband. 14. Sadly, whilst giving birth to the last, she passed away, inspiring her king to build this massive structure. Both Shah Jahan and his love are buried beneath it. At number three, Brothers at Odds. Shah Jahan's rule was considered the golden rule of the Mughal Empire, so how do you top that? Aurangzeb did not even bother trying, and he kinda sucked. He was Shah Jahan's third son, and he was a very military minded man, showing tactical and strategic military skill and unrivaled determination. Whereas his brother was a man of letters, and no, not the kind from Supernatural. Aurangzeb wanted power, and so in order to secure his rule, he confined his ailing father to his own palace, caused the death of one of his brothers, and had two more of his brothers, a son and a nephew, executed. He was literally committing fatricide left, right, and center. But it didn't matter to him because he gained control. Control. His desire to prematurely end the lives of those who stood in his way was described as, quote, a wolf thirsting for the blood of his brothers, end quote. He would think that this motivation to gain power and rule on his own terms would mean that he had big plans for the empire, which in a way is true, but those plans and changes led to a lot of oppression, but we will get to that in a bit. I number two, staked. Before we get into the oppression that Aurangzeb caused to his empire, let's talk about Emperor Farooq Siyar. Farooq Siyar was emperor of the Mughal Empire from 1713 to 1719. He was described as an incapable ruler who gave his power to all of his advisors. His rule caused many conspiracies and plots to arise within the court. He caused a lot of people a lot of pain for his plight for power. With the help of his allies, he gave many of his enemies the gift of the big sleep, but by far the most ruthless thing he did was killed Jahandar Shah and Zulkifakar Khan Nazrat Zung. What made their deaths so brutal was the fact that when they went eh, the emperor hung their heads on poles and just to add insult to injury, he made their parents walk at their funeral. Luckily for the people of the Mughal Empire, Farooq Sahir was killed by unknown assailants at the instructions of his close relatives, putting an end to his awful reign. And finally, at number one, the Great Oppressor. Aurangzeb's rule sort of had two chapters to it. At first, Aurangzeb was a capable ruler of a mixed Muslim Hindu empire who was feared yet respected for his vigor and skill. But around 1680, Aurangzeb's rule changed drastically in both policy and attitude. His once unified people of both Muslims and Hindus broke apart, and people of Hindu faith became subordinates, not colleagues. On top of that, Aurangzeb added some more oppression to the mix and not only destroyed Hindu temples, but he also also reimposed the Giza tax on non-Muslims after the tax was initially banned by Emperor Akbar. For the first 20 years of Aurangzeb's rule, he did not impose a tax, but all of a sudden he started demanding these payments, and historians believe that Hindu uprisings are what caused the emperor to act harshly towards the non-Muslim population. This discrimination caused a revolt to unfold that Aurangzeb's third son supported. Aurangzeb spent his last 50 years taking his aggressions out on the Hindus in the empire, and it's for this reason that he is remembered by many as a tyrant. Number 10, Boudicca. She was very tall, the glance of her eye most fierce, her voice harsh. A great mass of the reddest hair fell down to her hips. Her appearance was terrifying. Sounds awesome to me. One of the most famous queens in British history, Queen Boudicca was originally co-ruler of the Iceni tribe of East Anglia, alongside her husband, King Prasitagus. That is, she was until the Roman governor of Britain at the time attacked. Prasitagus was killed and his lands and household were plundered by the Romans. Boudicca and her daughters were rather savagely treated as well. So much so that after the fact she rose up leading other tribes of Britons who banded together and decided to take the fight back to the Romans. The Britons captured the Roman settlement of modern day Colchester with the imperial agent fleeing to Gaul. They fought to London and to St. Albans, storming the cities and sending the defenders fleeing. The Britons desecrated the Roman cemeteries, mutilating statues and breaking tombstones. The Roman governor of Britain at the time, who had fled with his troops into the safety of the Roman military zone, 
challenged Boudicca with an army of 10,000 regulars and auxiliaries. Win the battle or perish, that is what I, a woman, will do. You men can live on in slavery if that's what you want. It's a pretty good quote. The battle was a brutal defeat though, with Boudicca taking poison to avoid becoming a prisoner. Criminal to the Romans, but I mean, a hero to pretty much everyone else. Number 9. Nefertiti Kind of hard to call this a crime, but basically Nefertiti was the wife of the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep IV. Being close to equal in power to her husband, as well as very influential in her own right, she and her husband did something quite scandalous. They decided to turn their backs on almost the entire pantheon of Egyptian gods, sort of. They made one god the prime god of Egyptian religion during their reign. That would be the god of the sun, Aten. They moved the capital of Egypt to a new location, which they named after Aten, and they even both changed their names. He became Akhenaten, and she became, give me a sec here, um, Nefer Neferatau, nope, Nefer, <laughs> Nefer Neferaten, Nefertiti. There's like a hyphen in there, I don't know. Both of those names, as you may have noticed, have the name Aten in them. Nobody liked this change and it was quickly reverted after they were no longer in power. It sure was scandalous though. Number eight, Anne Boleyn. Honestly, for most of the wives of Henry VIII, it's a little hard to, well one, pick one, but also two, really know if any of the things they were accused of actually happened or if they were just easy excuses. But nonetheless, here we are, and since we haven't talked about any before, why not start with the second one, who was, was pretty much the catalyst for Henry VIII and England breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church and forming a whole new church resulting in the deaths of an eventual thousands of people. You see, divorce is strictly prohibited in the Roman Catholic Church, so when Henry met Anne, his wife Catherine, who had not produced him a son to carry his name, just kind of had to go prompting the whole damn reformation. Was it worth it? No, because the marriage lasted three years before she was charged with infidelity and incest and lost her head. God, I kind of feel bad for anyone associated with King Henry VIII though. Number seven, Galizo Maria Saforza. This guy was just bad. Like, like all bad. Not like Deadpool where he does some bad stuff for good reasons, anti-hero kind of guy. This, nah, this guy's just straight bad, straight evil. In one story of the disturbed king, he had a rival's hands chopped off. No more tennis matches. He left prisoners in hanging cages and even had a priest that made a prediction about him that he didn't find all too flattering in prison with little food and water. It got to the point where the man had to eat his own refuse. So if you cross Galeazzo Maria Saforza, um, don't, don't do it. Number six, Ivan the Terrible. I'm not that familiar with Russian history before the year 1900, but there is a lot to unpack. It's not all Lenin and hammers and sickles and such. Ivan the Terrible was the first Tsar of Russia, and he was quite the specimen. From having struck his daughter-in-law and unlifing his son in a fit of rage, he was one nasty dude. However, I believe the story of him in St. Basil's Cathedral is more noteworthy. As the story goes, Ivan commissioned an architect to build St. Basil's Cathedral. If you've ever seen it, you know how gorgeous it is. All the Onion Palace buildings and whatnot, you know what I'm talking about. Ivan was so impressed with the architect's work that he had his eyes gouged out so that no one could ever build another structure or gaze upon another structure as magnificent as the cathedral. That's hardcore, dude. That's pretty hardcore. So if you do a bad job, he probably would have got rid of you. And if you do a good job, he'll still get rid of you. Number five, Ferdinand the First of Naples. This one is so strange. I. I can't even, I, I have to mention, I, I cannot not say it. In a nutshell, Ferdinand looked normal, just your average European king. I mean, what, what could be wrong about this guy, right? He looks pretty normal. Well, the guy was basically Buffalo Bill. Ferdinand liked to keep his enemies close, taken after a little bit of Michael Corleone. However, so close that oftentimes dinner guests would mysteriously disappear and end up not breathing. Afterwards, they would be mummified and pickled and dressed as if they were still alive. He would then invite more guests over for dinner to show them what could happen if they crossed him. He would open the doors and show them a sick dinner-esque area play thing of people dressed up and that's, that's, that's what bad people do. That's what Buffalo Bill would do. That's gross, we don't like that. Number four, Henry VIII. 
Are you even surprised he's on this list? I mean, come on, it's Henry VIII. But I, I support all healthy marriages and I support healthy divorces. Sometimes things just don't work out, but that doesn't mean you have to go all Johnny Depp on the situation. There's better ways to work things out. Well, in Henry's case, it may not be televised on national TV or global TV in this case. It was more like Edward Scissorhands, if you will. Henry VIII is famous for dealing with his wives. When the church would not grant him the divorce he so wished for, he removed his wife's head from her body. And then he remarried and divorced another, and then he, uh, well, another one lost her head and then divorced another, and then finally he passed away and the wife lived on. It makes sense, sure, that's, all I'm saying is the man went a little too far. That's all I'm saying, just a little bit. Number three, John King of England. This is the dude who wrote the Magna Carta, which for legal students everywhere is like planet Krypton. It's where it all starts. The whole Superman, the law, everything. It's the basis of everything. Besides Hammurabi's code, of course. Well, it's not like he signed it very enthusiastically, and the man really wasn't the nicest. He's also known for taking 22 of his most noble knights and throwing them away in a dungeon until they starved and didn't wake up for, well, no breakfast. He betrayed his brother Richard the Lionheart, the very famous Richard the Lionheart, who also wasn't very nice either, and is suspected of being the mastermind behind the delifing of his nephew. Ooh, talk about family scandal. Number two, Napoleon Bonaparte. I know, hear me out though. The story of France and Napoleon is one for the history books. I mean, really, it's, it's so strange. Imagine a country that violently overthrows its king and queen, and then while in the middle of that, which could be described as the worst political strife in history, you then go to war, which, if you know how that, it's, it's not a good idea. You, 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 you're probably going to lose. Except Napoleon didn't lose. Napoleon took France to war like five times within a, a short time period and won most of them. It's pretty good. Well, good for winning, not good for the people that make it. That's when he declared himself Emperor of France and kind of lost his way, which it's stupid because it defeated the whole purpose and point of the revolution and the democracy that the people were so fighting for. Eventually the international community caught up with him and banned him to an island twice because he came back and said, I'm back. And then no, back to the island. Go, go back. You're going, you're going back. Number one, Elvis Presley. Look, I know, I know it's it's Elvis, but he's the king of rock and roll, man. You, you can't go wrong with Elvis. It, plus, it kind of works, too, because I think people have a really good image of him, but he actually wasn't... You'll see. He is the king of rock and roll, to be fair, and he's more famous than any king on this list, actually. But the king of rock and roll isn't so squeaky clean and certainly not a stranger to crime and scandal. At some points in his career, you could find him excessive drinking and using um, illicit substances, if you will. He might have had to put on those jailhouse rocking denims, well, for real. Back in 1956, at the peak of his fame, really, Elvis got into a physical altercation with two gas station attendants after fans began to crowd him. It was a messy situation, and he was actually up on charges of battery and disorderly conduct. Not a good look for the king, baby. The king's gotta stay clean. In our number 10 spot, we have Irene of Athens. Starting off this list today, we are heading back to the Byzantine Empire. Irene of Athens was the mother of Constantine VI, and while the pair co-ruled together for almost two decades, things ended in quite the tragedy. After the pair co-ruled, Irene did go on to rule on her own from 797 to 802 CE, but you might be wondering how she managed to outrule her son. Well, Irene, the ambitious ruler wanted full control all to herself, so she asked for the help of some political allies to pull off a scheme against her own son. She began to lead a conspiracy against him to try and get him out of power. The duo did end up reconciling their relationship, but this is not where the story ends. In 786, the public began to turn their backs on Constantine because he had decided to divorce his wife and instead marry his mistress. Irene saw this as a second chance and once again chose to conspire against her own son. Honestly, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, this lady did not care. Here's where things in the story get exceptionally gory. Irene not only ordered the arrest of her son, but also ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Yep. That's how good old Mumsy came into power. In our number nine spot today, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was a Hungarian noblewoman who lived from August of 1560 to August of 1614. She was born into one of the oldest and most powerful families in Transylvania, and she was well educated and ran various estates and bore many children. Oh, and this is all happening while she was also killing young women and bathing in their blood. Yeah. 
Weird, gross, terrible. Elizabeth is known for killing her servants and bathing in their blood as she believed it would keep her young. Guess no one told her about moisturizing and minding your own business. All accounts of Elizabeth remember her as a terrible, evil person. It is said that her number of victims most likely ranges somewhere from 175 to 200, but some claim it might be as many as 600 people. It is no wonder she is referred to as Countess Dracula. In our number 8 spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed, and during the time her son was just too young to rule. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out using scalding hot water. Yeah, don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. She is the ultimate ride or die. It seems like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slaying, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from, she devised a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she was not okay. Number 7. Queen Dida Queen Dida of Kashmir was quite an ambitious queen mother. Dida seized complete administrative control during her husband's reign, ultimately becoming queen regent for her son and grandsons. That ain't enough for Miss Dida here. Mere advisory for her? No sir, she despised being just an advisor, and well, she disposed of all three of her grandsons using medieval forms of witchcraft and torture. Yikes. How dare they make Gma their advisor. Queen Dida got what she wanted at least, as she then reigned as monarch for 23 years, being in some form of power for nearly the whole of Kashmir's 10th century. And while she may have been more than a little brutal, she was honestly one of the best and strongest rulers Kashmir has ever had. Number 6. Queen Nandi Queen Nandi of the Zulu Empire has a story that literally sounds like it's straight out of a movie. Before the Zulu Empire ever came to become a thing at all, Nandi was impregnated by a Zulu chief in the 1700s, giving birth to a son they named Shaka. But being the third wife of the chief, she and her son were often ridiculed and shamed by other chieftains. Despite all that, Nandi raised Shaka to be an extremely fierce warrior. Shaka grew up to become the Zulu chief in 1815, and Nandi became the queen mother alongside him, known in English as the Great She-Elephant. She alongside her son wreaked havoc on those who had mistreated her and Shaka. But since Shaka remained unmarried, it was Nandi who funnily enough remained the power behind the throne of the Zulu Empire throughout her lifetime. She is the reason the Empire ever existed in the first place, and if any of what she did was a crime, uh, I kinda get it. Number 5. Julia Agrippina, Nero Maker Yes, making Nero should be considered a crime. But honestly, Julia Agrippina of Rome did quite a bit more than just that, and I can see where Nero got it all from. You see, Agrippina wanted to be in power, and when her uncle, Emperor Claudius, separated from his wife due to a scandal, Agrippina saw an opportunity, no matter how messed up it seems to both us and the people of the time. Agrippina seduced her uncle, became his fourth wife, and by extension, became the empress. But it doesn't stop there. She manipulated her uncle husband into making her son Nero heir to the throne and set up a marriage between Nero and her daughter-in-law Octavia. It's even rumored that she poisoned the food that ended her husband's life, allowing Nero to rise to power, which really bit her in the butt when Nero had her assassinated. What is this crazy family? Good God. Number 4. Queen Theodora Queen Theodora was scandalous before she even became queen. She was involved in theater from a young age, and one of her most well-known character portrayals involved her stripping down to next to nothingness. But her acting career slowed right down when she met and married Justinian I, who was the heir to the throne of the Byzantine Empire. The two of them were as thick as thieves and ruled together. 
but that doesn't mean she didn't have a knack for dispatching of those who threatened her position. She was scandalous, but she did way more good than she did bad. She set up houses for ladies of the night, worked for women's marriage and dowry rights, and banished brothel keepers from the Byzantine Empire. She was also a huge supporter of monophysitism. I hope I said that right. She's even considered a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church of the modern day. Killing it, Theo. That's kind of a bad joke, actually. Number three, the great she-wolf of France. Queen Isabella of France started off her queen life married to Edward II of England, who preferred the company of men to his own wife. This is obviously a precarious and possibly extremely frustrating situation to find oneself in, but she kept it bottled up and even gave birth to a son, Edward III, until it all came to a head when her husband found a new favorite. She visited France and had an affair with Lord Roger Mortimer, an exile from England. But the better twist came when Isabella, alongside Mortimer and a mercenary army, invaded England, took the throne, and she became queen regent for her son, Edward III, until he came into power. She also was probably responsible for the dispatching of her husband, Edward II, while he was captured. Eventually, her son would come into power, and she was imprisoned for two years before being allowed to live a quieter life in retirement. Number two. Queen Fredegund. I was constantly double taking almost the entire time I was reading about this woman. She was crazy ruthless and all seemingly for the betterment of both her bloodline and the Merovingian kingdom. She became queen in the 5th century, marrying King Chilperic and organizing the death of Queen Galswintha and sending Queen Odovera to a convent. When Brunhild, a big enemy for the king and sister of the late queen, swore vengeance on them, Fredegund brutally destroyed Brynhild's husband and sisters, destroying them as in that kind of thing. The queen also made sure that all of the other heirs to the throne stopped breathing, making it a sure thing that her bloodline would occupy the Merovingian throne. Her son, Clotar II, was only a baby when the king met his end in 587. So, of course, this ambitious queen rose up to power, fighting battles, quelling rebellions, and ensuring the smooth running of the Merovingian kingdom in her role as queen regent. She met her end in 597, 10 years after her husband, but Clotar II continued in his mom's footsteps, having Brunhild and all her descendants removed from existence, resulting in 20 years of peace. So it's good. Number one, Cleopatra. A list of scandalous queens would not be complete without one of the most well-known and famous rulers in history. Cleopatra VII, Philopater, was the last pharaoh Egypt ever had, reigning from 51 to 30 BC. Her life was full of scandal. When she first came into power, she was co-ruler with her husband and brother, Ptolemy XIII. But that didn't last very long as the two did not see eye to eye and it started a huge civil war in the country. At the same time, a conflict from Rome made its way to Egypt as well, resulting in Julius Caesar allegedly being seduced by Cleopatra and helping her end her brother's life. And again, being co-ruler with another of her brothers, also named Ptolemy, and ending the life of one of her sisters. She was also having an affair with Caesar and even produced a son with him, who became co-ruler with her after Caesar's death and after her other brother was seemingly assassinated. <sighs> I'm so glad I was not a part of these families. Just death and betrayal everywhere. She then went on to seduce second Roman triumvirate member Mark Anthony and sided with him when Octavian and Mark Anthony engaged in the final war of the Roman Republic which Anthony lost, fighting with and alongside him until she poisoned herself to avoid being paraded through Rome and executed by the victorious Octavian. Number 10, Marie Antoinette. I wonder what it must have been like to be the Queen of France, to sit in a palace and eat all those delicious foods that your cooks can make while the peasants outside struggle to eat and sing about bread for some reason. I don't know, lay Miz reverence. It's a life of beauty, balls, and not listening to what the stinky peasants outside have to say. Except that's the very reason why Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France. You can only spend so much time and money on your exuberant lifestyle before the people get fed up. I mean, these people have nothing. It's kind of difficult to control people when they don't even have food at home. They let the queen know how upset they were when they decided to remove her head from her body. Number nine, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. Sometimes it's just in the name, isn't it? 
Like Mario, you know that he's an Italian plumber. Or Luigi, you can tell that that's an Italian plumber's brother. And uh, King DDD, King of the DDDs or, or something, I, I don't know. Okay, maybe the names don't always give it away, but Bloody Mary does. Most known for her liberal use of the wooden stake and the whole uh, burning folks alive thing. I, I wish I could tell you it was for barbecue, but it was actually for some more serious religious persecution and, and reformation. The Catholic Church was hot, but the witches and heretics burning at the stake were hotter. No cap. Number 8, Reina Valona of Madagascar. This one is a new one for me. Didn't know about this, but here we go. So basically, Queen Reina Lo Queen, I'm, gonna say, I'm just gonna call her Queen Ravioli because I can't pronounce it. Basically, Queen Ravioli takes over from her past husband. She says to herself, how can I make things better? Huh, I know. How about I become a ruthless, bloodthirsty, unaliving tyrant? Great idea, right? Yes, very uh, not great success. Yes, unfortunately, she did many heinous things. Something I found out to be particularly interesting, however, was her destroying the many good things her husband had set up before her. Madagascar had some European intervention, and while it's true that a lot of times that is a bad thing, and yeah, it's a bad thing. And it does bring some bad stuff with it. However, it also brings a lot of good things with it. In Madagascar's case, it was markets, modern schools, trade, and diplomacy with, with Europe. And that's that's good. Money's good. You like that. Well, the queen wasn't having any of that. So she reformed. And by that, I mean she repressed and, and re-unalived people. In our number seven spot today, we have Wu Zetian. Throughout the long and storied history of China, there has only ever been one woman who held supreme power, and that is Empress Wu Zetian. Of course, considering this historic feat, she wanted to ensure that she kept her power by any means necessary. She had all of her rivals killed, so anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The Empress ordered the execution of the previous Empress as well as members of her own family. She had multiple methods of taking these people out, and rumor has it that she even had her own grandmother and two of her grandchildren killed for going against her. It didn't matter who you were, if you threatened her power, you were done for. It is said that after a while, the Empress decided to do a little less killy-killy and a little more lovey-lovey. Yeah. Apparently she started spending more time with her lovers using some aphrodisiacs, you know. We all are a little crazy when we're young, but as we get older, we all crave the simplicity and just someone to love, right? Of course though, people don't forget, and they were sure to exact their revenge. The people fought back and ended up having all of her lovers killed, and the empress herself was exiled. You know what they say about karma, she does not miss. In our number six spot today, we have Mary the First. Queen Mary the First didn't get the nickname Bloody Mary from nowhere. Oh no, this name was certainly earned. Mary was a Catholic queen in a Protestant country, which as you can imagine, was quite problematic when she ascended the throne of England in 1553. Although her reign only lasted five years, Years, she made a mark on history in a multitude of ways. She was the first true Queen of England, and she was quite a vicious ruler. During her time as Queen, Mary announced a war against Protestantism, which left many who belonged to the religion being charged with hearsay. Doesn't sound all that bad until you learn that at the time, the usual sentence for hearsay was to be burned at the stake. Nice. Mary was responsible for the burning of over 300 Protestants during her time as Queen, which unsurprisingly left her quite unpopular. Popular. In our number 5 spot today, we have Caterina de Medici. Caterina was an Italian noblewoman born into a famous family. She was Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, with marriage to King Henry II, and she was the mother of four future French kings. It wasn't exactly surprising news that her husband, Henry II, had a lifelong affair with a mistress, but on his deathbed, when he was begging to see his mistress, Caterina refused and left him to die a lonely and painful death. Do I entirely blame her? No, but it's also a pretty heartless move, you know what I mean? The daughter of the queen, Margaret, was said to be rebellious, but her mother wasn't just going to let her get away with it. The mother and daughter would fight over the married daughter's extramarital affairs, and it is said that Katerina's scream could be heard echoing throughout the palace. One fight between the two even saw her locking her daughter up in a castle, never to see her again. In our number four spot today, we have Agrippina the Younger. Roman Empress Julia Agrippina of Rome was pretty spoiled. She lived a 
lavish life. Her husband was the emperor and she had a family, but that just wasn't enough for her and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, so she tricked her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing the Roman law so that they could get married. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died. Could be a really convenient coincidence, or it could have been a totally planned hit. I'm not accusing anyone, I'm just telling you what the word on the street is. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had to force her out of power. Julia, as you could imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world she desired the most, and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow him, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. In our number three spot today, we have Maria Eleonora. Maria of Brandenburg, the Queen of Sweden, has quite a horrifying story that relates to the birth of her daughter. Apparently, Maria wasn't feeling the overwhelming joy of childbirth because although she was hoping for a son, she gave birth to a daughter, Queen Christina. Maria wasn't shy about her opinion. She apparently screamed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Okay, it's kind of rude. She referred to her new child as a monster and apparently just absolutely did not want anything to do with Christina and would have rathered that she just didn't exist. Apparently she even placed Christina to sleep next to the corpse of her father who had passed away. It's like a different kind of messed up. Things clearly weren't right with Maria. In our number two spot today we have Queen Isabella. Isabella co-ruled Spain from 1451 to 1504 with King Ferdinand II and during her reign she had some pretty horrific views and feelings. She wanted to get rid of all Spanish Muslims and Jewish people from her kingdom. Sounds a bit like another evil ruler from history. In 1492, she ordered that all Jewish people either convert to Catholicism or get thrown out of the kingdom. She made them all come to Spanish court to either pledge their faith to Catholicism or get exiled from Spain. How horrible is that? The queen has also been attributed with establishing the Spanish Inquisition, which definitely is not a historical highlight. Both Isabella and Ferdinand are often said to have done great things for Spain, which in some cases is true, but at what cost? and for what reason? In her number one spot today, we have Rana Valona I, the last queen of Madagascar. She ruled the kingdom for 33 years from 1828 until 1861. There is no doubt that she was committed to her kingdom and that she would do anything for it, but in this plight, she was cruel and violent. She initially came to power after the death of her husband, and once she had it, she was not letting it go. The queen was able to keep away the advances of the French and British, and she left the bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. In 1845, the queen ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months. They were meant to have this massive buffalo hunt. Well, she clearly wasn't thinking everything through because 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and uh, not one buffalo was hunted. Some records of history state that she even had her own uncle executed in order to protect her power. And there is an even more gruesome story. Some people even state that she ended her her own mother's life by starving her to death. That is some epic level of evil, if it's true. Kicking off the list at number 10, a goodnight kiss. We'll start off funny, okay? History can be funny sometimes, even when it's not meant to be, and it's meant to be completely serious, I can't help but read this information and laugh. Royals were sweating constantly about people trying to take them out, of course. I mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy stalked the queen over and over for years. Historically, these royals have been on the lookout for enemies, and the way that they prevent these attacks, yeah, sometimes it can be a little funny. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you heard about this weird position in the castle? What an odd job this is. A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned their ale, which is, you know, a pretty lousy job there. Either having a good day or a bad day, no in between. But they also had a guy kiss the king's sheets every day, just, they just kissed the entire bed. The king size, may I remind you, massive bed. King Henry VIII, this guy hired somebody to literally just go in, get snuggled up, and just make sure the king's bed wasn't poisoned. There's nothing on it that's gonna make the skin go all ouchy. But he would just get in his bed and just, 
go to sleep for a bit. You are required to make the king's bed every morning, of course, and before he gets back in, you gotta get in and you gotta get in and kiss that bed, man. You gotta kiss that bed real good. Mwah, mwah. Let's go. Mwah. All right, time to clock out for the day. Mwah. One more for good luck. Clothes as well. That was touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure worn and touched. With It's so weird. Guy's wearing my clothes in my bed. No way. I'd rather get poisoned. Like, yo, take my jeans off. Who is that guy? Get back here. Like, imagine marrying that king, and it's like, oh, hang on, before we get snugged in, this guy has to go and kiss your sheets. She's like, ew, what? Why does my sheets smell like breath? Everything smells like breath. Number nine, enemas. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the household. This, yeah. Back in the olden days, ye olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Well, rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies. Specifically, King Louis XIV. Guy loved enemas. Just big old fan of enemas. It's believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. Thousands, it's a lot of, a lot of decimals. Decimals for enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. Like, guy, that's like 112 too much, I'd say. I don't know. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier, by using um, almond milk for the enemas. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out almond milk and you're like, oh, no, not again. Come on, Louis, please, I just ate. Number eight, no bathing in this house. Bathing in the olden days wasn't fully understood, if that makes any sense. Like in a medical book, in an official 16th century medical book, the medical advice was use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? What? What does it even mean? Why is every shred of medical knowledge always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century. A doctor would just be like, ah, yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick and you'll be on your way. Like, what? Do you have any halls? Help me. Help me, dude. Now I'm just mad. I just, like, bro, I have pneumonia. I need, I need medicine. So of course they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. Of course. So King James IV, apparently this guy never took a bath in his life. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass lice to others just by being in the same room that he was earlier. So not at the same time, he would come in, do his king stuff, leave, and the lice would be like, Pew! and they would just wait in that room and get on someone else. That's so gross, that's horrible. Lice would emit off this man, like the, he's like the stinky kid from Charlie Brown with the stinky cloud. That's just like lice around this guy. <laughs> Margaret Tudor was married to King James. Yeah, must have loved the no bathing thing, eh? Oh, oh. Number seven, Empress Irene. Kings, queens, emperors, and empresses. Chances are these folks are related. It's a family thing. It me a familia. You know what I mean? It's how it goes when you're the king, and you need a son to continue the lineage. Even though I would like to argue that if you're gone, you're gone. So who really cares who's taken over? Just my opinion. Speaking of eye gouging. Oh, wait, I didn't mention that before. I made a segue, but okay, that's all right, bad segue. Well, the, the topic of discussion here is Empress Irene. Basically, her son was taking too much power for himself. She was losing hers and yada yada, and his eyes were gouged out from two guards ordered by his dear, sweet mother. Can you blame her though? I mean, come on, he was threatening a rule. She worked so hard to get there. The chief was just silent on this one. Chief had no words for that one, guys, no words. Number six, Fu Hao. Another woman in history married to a man of the stinky patriarchy. Worst, except Fu Hao didn't want to be wife 57 of 64. She wanted more than that. And to be honest, I think that's fair. You go girl, who wants to be wife 57 of 64? Maybe some people in Utah, I don't know. What's maybe slightly more unholy than having that many wives is going on an epic military campaign and raging war in the Shang Dynasty. A warrior queen, if you will. We know some of this history based on her tomb as she was buried with ceremonial weapons, knives, blades, swords, some dogs, some uh, human sacrifices, gold, money, jade, and lots of other valuable goodies. Just makes you want to loot all the stuff in there, doesn't it? I mean, Jade's pretty cool. This was a common practice amongst male warriors back then, but you know what? Good for her and all that unaliving. Way to go, sister. I like it. Very nice. Okay. Number five, Tamiris. 
Honestly, every time I face her in Civilization 6, it just ends badly. I'll spend a few turns building my economy or maybe organizing some troops, and I look back over at her cities and she's already amassed a massive army and is ahead in science. Yeah, I'm not the best Civ 6 player, but sheesh lady, come on, give me a break. This probably has something to do with her real life counterpart. Tamiris was a woman who lost her son to Cyrus the Great. So she said to herself, I don't know what's so great about the Cyrus guy. There's a trailer park voice reference in there somewhere. Just imagine Ricky telling Cyrus off. I don't know, you, you gotta find it. Basically, after losing her son, she gathered the troops and commenced battle. The almighty Cyrus met his end, which given how the way women were treated back then probably didn't go over too well with PR. Yeah, she got her revenge though. Number four, the Trung sisters. The Trung sisters are double trouble. You're getting two queens at once here. China was being down bad and trying to conquer some things that maybe they shouldn't have. Naughty, no. The Trung sisters came to answer the call. These girls are actually revered as heroes still today in Vietnam. But what they were able to do for so long was very impressive. China had a very impressive army, no surprise there. And Vietnam was a much smaller country, or kingdom I guess you'd say, and their army was not as impressive. But the sisters managed to hold them off for three years. Three years with their forces. That, that is crazy good. That is very impressive and perhaps a lot of bloodshed too. Sadly, the sisters waded off into the waters before they could be captured because after that long fighting, I wouldn't want to be captured either. Number three, Grace O'Malley. Avasi land lovers, ye be looking for Grace O'Malley. Well, then ye come to the right place, sir. Thank you, thank you. That is my private impression. I will be here all week. Bad impressions aside, Grace O'Malley wasn't a traditional queen to be fair, but what she didn't have in regular queen qualities, she did make up for that in being a badass pirate. Nice. This is another one where I'm gonna ask Hollywood for a movie, please. Irish Pirate Queen? Come on guys, that's just a movie begging to be made. Grace O'Malley was a fierce pirate from the age of 11 and a wise woman who ruled the seas after her father's passing. I don't really have much to say after that to be honest. I'll just wait for Hollywood to make their move. And maybe you can cast me in there. And I can put on some long red hair and some boots and I could, I could swim and just put the red hair on me right now. I just look so good. <laughs> Number two, Queen Victoria. Okay, hear me out on this one. This one has more to do with their lineage, per se, than her, but it's her somewhat to blame. Okay, so Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, King George V of Britain, and Wilhelm Kaiser II of Germany were all first cousins. Their grandma was Queen Victoria. What? I, I know, right? Isn't that, isn't that weird? Yeah, it's weird. Imagine how crazy your bloodline has to be for that. And, you know, the fact that during World War I, all three of these cousins were at war with each other. I mean, that, that's just insane. I mean, families fight, sure, but come on, man. Get the mustard gas off the table, bro. Come on. That's cheap. Just don't. Number one, my mom. My mom, I love her so much. She, she's the best. But man, sometimes, oh, she's so unfair. I had to do chores when I was a kid, and I had to put down the toilet seat, and worst of all, she made me put the little toothpaste back in the tube when I was done with it. Ugh, I mean, come on, right? Not like she ever did anything for me, like birth me, feed me, raise me, clothe me, and love me unconditionally. Number 10, what a drag. Bachelor number one, what would you do if I refused to marry you? Well, I would probably get quite violent and lead to the destruction of 10,000 lives at the Battle of Hastings. Might just drag you around by your hair and see where the night goes. William I, or more appropriate, William the Conqueror, was a fierce warrior and the first Norman King of England. Being the illegitimate child he was to the throne, some people didn't exactly respect the power moves old Willie was making. People rebelled, and he crushed them. Oh, and there was this one time that he fancied a woman named Matilda. Being the respected woman that she was, she declined Willie's advances. Willie, not taking no for an answer, promptly dragged her around by the hair until she agreed to marry him. Gee, what a, what a swell guy. Number nine, let them eat cake. France had seen better days in the 1790s. People were starving, the economy was bust, and for some reason, the poor citizens were being taxed the most. When cries were made from the people, they demanded that change be made. King Louis XVI being the great leader he was, he listened to the people and there was no problem ever again. Oh wait, he did nothing and the country had a bloody revolution. The man supposed to be leading his people failed to act. In fact, he did less than nothing, often trying to silence the riots by force. But when people are very hungry and you're living fat with high society, 
you can lose your head in all that chaos. While the famous quote, let them eat cake, may not have actually been said, it's a good reminder of the disconnect between the upper class and poor. Leaving your people to starve isn't the best idea if you want to be a king for a long time. Number 8. Cashback King George III had a simple ask of the American colonies. Right then, we just saved you all from the French and Indians, so now it's time to do the right thing and pick up the bill. Britain introduced new taxes on the colonies in order to pay back what it had spent on the previous war. But in reality, he was asking the colonies to pay up without much in return. Basically, I'm the king, I saved your skins, give me more money. Which most people at the time couldn't afford. And I'm still going to boss you around. The British Empire may have been victorious, but it was the colonists who felt all the effects of the war and the economy. This happened multiple times before some patriots had had enough and decided to act. And what he did when the people he was forcing to give money spilt a little tea? Well, he sent British troops for a semi-friendly military occupation. I'd hate to loan this guy a nickel. Boy. Number 7. Queen Caroline Queen Caroline Ba ba ba! She went out in a horrible way. We can't sing about her. History remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she went out. It was bad. It was actually written down in an epigram attributed to the 18th century poet Alexander Pope. Here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Again, it rhymes! Why do all the. Why is everything rhyming? This is so awful! Who can be like, yeah, yeah, write that down, that's good, that's good, wait, wait, it does rhyme, that's good, yeah, check it out. Rest in peace, my gosh, her husband, he was certainly no help at all. Caroline was previously married to George IV, and this guy locked her out of Westminster on coronation day. So yeah, she went out in a horrible way, but let's not forget the marriage that came beforehand. That wasn't pleasant either, nothing in this guy or this marriage was pleasant. Number 6. Henry VIII. Of course he's back, he had 6 wives and it was pretty much entirely bad for all of them, yeah. It was the late 1400s. Henry took the throne in 1509. This guy was only 17 years old when all this madness began to unfold. Only days after the execution of Anne, who I mentioned on part one of this list, so days after he married his third wife, Jane Seymour. Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour's mothers were first cousins, so they were close, and during all of this, they of course went head to head more than once. Jane died shortly after giving birth to Edward VI on October 12, 1537. I can't mention King Henry's wives and leave a couple out. This is just a history channel. We have to mention all of them, okay? Number five, George V. Turned out this guy loved stamps. Maybe a bit too much though, I'd say. It was almost distracting. It was taking up many hours of his day. Like, you know, focus on other things, like say maybe, I don't know, the war. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everyone's trying to stay alive. George is just in the background like... <laughs> like all collections, they started at an early age. It's now at a point where it's just, you know, past impressive and borderline strange. Especially if you're a royal, like you're really going hard with this. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each was 60 pages, full of stamps. That's 20,000 pages full of stamps. That's a lot, way too many stamps. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps, or rather the King of Philately. That's the official term for collecting stamps. We're historians here, we have to make it official. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record. Ho ho! The most money ever spent on a stamp. This guy dropped like 220,000 on one single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about the fool who had spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp. And he was proud. He was like, Oh, that fool? It was I. Number four, Rudolf II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552. He was known as a collector. Yeah, some princes collected stamps, others collect zoo animals. We're all different. Yeah, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and not bears, but orangutans. So good luck getting your eight hours. He also collected human artifacts, like body parts after they've been, you know, so that's. Watch your step, I guess. Welcome to MTV Cribs. Don't mind the jar of eyes. Watch out for the lion's tail. Careful. What a mess. He's quite important in history though, I guess. He supported the scientific revolution and he also poured tons of money into astrology. So next time you read your horoscope, remember it's bones in the jar Benny that's responsible for that one. And also in case you're wondering, yeah, he didn't pay attention to any of his wives or anything like that. He was just, no, nope, jars for me, jars animals. I'm all set. Number three, Don Carlos. Spanish crown prince, the guy who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Let's talk about him. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was, yeah, I wanna say worse things, but he was just a really bad person. YouTube, he was just a bad guy. Now it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter than the other. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him with these disabilities growing up and people often feel bad for him a little. To that I say don't. 
No, don't do it. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad. Dude was fine. Philip II of Spain? Yeah, he would hurt a lot of people. He would hurt animals and people just for fun. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how the pair of boots looked. He made somebody eat boots. We're not gonna feel bad for him on Bumblebee today. That's not what we're gonna do. He was also set up to marry Queen Elizabeth of Valois, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours, she was like, no, that's not gonna happen, no way. So she married his father instead. That's what happens, that's what happens when you're In 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos. Mary Queen of Scots was one of them. Margaret of Valois, we know what happened with her, and Anna of Austria, but his mental conditions grew worse and it went south, shocker. Number two, Heart of Glass. King Charles VI, once nicknamed the Beloved and then quickly nicknamed the Mad. What happened? After he became King of France in 1380, he would have these episodes, let's call them. He would believe he was made of glass and he didn't want anybody to touch him. He had this glass delusion, which was surprisingly not uncommon, believe it or not, for this time period. Believing you were made out of glass in some way, shape or form, be it in your head, butt, shoulders or back, really spiked around the mid 1400s and Charles VI, AKA Charles the Mad, he wouldn't let anybody, not even his wife, near him at all. I'm not making fun of somebody for having a fear like that. I mean, most likely historians believe he was schizophrenic, so obviously I'm not ripping on that. But Alexandria of Bavaria, another royal who had this glass delusion, she too believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass, so she had to enter rooms sideways to avoid it shattering. I don't know what's going on with this glass delusion, but I'm glad it went away, I don't know. And finally, number one, King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians. So that should already tell you a good amount of this guy. George was another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his, you know, intimate side quests, if you know what I'm saying here, like all these other kings we've talked about. He was a bit busy being a stupid fool. This man was trying literally everything to get a woman to sleep with him. Although he was the king and he was already set up, he was like, nope, I'm gonna go and keep trying with strangers and random. And he would throw a tantrum if they said no, or he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get the girl. Like, you know what I'm saying? One of those kind of monsters. He would also keep uh, trophies, lack of a better term, of all these conquests afterwards. He would ask each people that he slept with for a little piece of hair and then he would keep them, he would like store them. Back then it was kind of common, I guess, for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, weirdly enough, because you don't have phone numbers or like any sort of way to remember someone, photos, I don't know. So you kept their hair. But after the king died, his brother found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. So yeah, I'll leave you on that note. I think there's a hair in my mouth, that's kind of gross. Number 10, girl troubles. Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg was a kind and loving mother. So long as you were a boy. Unfortunately for the royal mom, she had a great difficulty giving birth to a male heir. So when her daughter Christina was born, Maria proclaimed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Eleanor often called her a monster. Oh yeah, and she did try to kill her on several occasions. Nothing says mental stability like blaming your daughter for being a daughter and not more like a son, because the male-dominated patriarchy that is royal society has no effect on this, right? Number nine, eyes on Irene. Irene was born into nobility and worked her way up the royal hierarchy. So why is Irene on this list? That's because she's probably the worst mother ever. When her son Constantine grew into adulthood, he made efforts to sideline his mother and challenge her position as a ruler. Irene, feeling some angry mom energy, retaliated in probably the worst way. In 797, Irene organized the capture of her son, and when he tried to escape, ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Constantine would later die of his injuries. Listen, I've had my fair share of minutes clocked out in the timeout corner. You can ask any one of my teachers, they'll tell you. And maybe even a few times today I should be put in the timeout corner too. But holy shit, mom, eye gouging? And that, I ain't that bad. Sheesh. Number eight. No cake for you. Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France, and for good reason. To make a long story short, she was part of the upper class nobility who benefited from the poor and overworked. When in a time of economic ruin, she still found a way to live a life of excess, while literally everyone else suffered. Spending all of France's money on completely ridiculous items, even by Lady Gaga standards, she jokingly became known as Madame Deficit. Eventually, she would be executed in the revolution. The expression, let them eat cake, was most likely not said by her or by anyone. But regardless if it was, it's a statement to show the complete disconnect and ignorance the nobility had when understanding just how bad things were for the working class. They most likely didn't care either. 
People were starving and putting heads on pikes. Do you really think they had time for cake, your highness? Oh, to be as beautiful and ignorant as an 18th century queen. Number seven. Terrible Ivan. He wasn't called Ivan the very friendly and generous and would for sure never cause any harm to anyone ever. He was Ivan the Terrible, and for good reason. His actions are very unholy. Let's start with the fact that he killed his son's pregnant wife. And when his son came to confront dear old dad, his son was struck with a pointed staff, killing him in a fit of rage. A legend tells us that once St. Basil's Cathedral was finished construction, he was so pleased with the architect to reward him for such magnificent work, Ivan gouged his eyes out so that no one would ever design something so beautiful again. His paranoia also caused the slaughter of Novgorod, where after he was done claiming thousands of lives, he burned all the fields just for good measure. Wouldn't want all those dead people farming without your permission. Should we tell them about the other world monuments? Number 6. Off with her head! Henry VIII is more well known for how he treated his wives more than his leadership. With a reign of over 20 years, the man had a few wives. Two of his wives were executed for ridiculous reasons, another was divorced. Turns out, actually, the church wouldn't grant that divorce he was looking for. So Henry went and did the next best thing. He broke away from the Catholic Church and dissolved the monasteries, taking their wealth and redistributing it as he saw fit. Nothing is unholier than trying to get away from the church. Historians believe that his divorce actually led to the English Reformation. Number 5. Nothing Left Alexander the Great was an excellent warrior for his time. Having conquered so much at a young age is really quite impressive. His empire stretched from Greece all the way to India. For a history class or a good book, this is fine, but in reality, he was a conqueror. The places he was marching into weren't exactly happy to have spear-wielding visitors. He laid siege on multiple cities, executed those who defied him, and sold people into YouTube's least favorite S-word. Just about checks off everything a guy needs to be considered a tyrant. History remembers his conquest, but I am for sure will not forget how brutal conquerors can really be. Number 4. Chop Chop While Maximilian Robespierre was not a king in the monarch sense, he did hold a lot of political power in France when the political climate was quite messy. Plus, France was at war. But even messier than that is the way he dealt with citizens who were deemed anti-revolution by sending them to the guillotine. Within a one year period, he sent 17,000 people to their dooms via the National Razor, or as it became to be known. He even began practicing deism, something he called the cult of the supreme being. And if you know your history, you know that you can't get away with that forever. And with some sweet poetic justice, Robespierre was sentenced to the guillotine. Number 3. All my friends are dead Usually when people expire, the human thing to do is bury said lifeless human. It's just what we do. But apparently Ferdinand I of Naples did not get that memo, instead taking a page from Night of the Museum. No, this is not a cute comedy movie starring Ben Stiller, but in reality a complete horrifying nightmare. Ferdinand took the saying, keep your enemies close, a little too literally, as his favorite form of punishment was to mummify his enemies. Which let's face it, if he's a king, there's gonna be plenty. And he would like to display these mummies and what's probably the coolest place to be if you're into that weird goth stuff. He did keep some alive in the dungeon, but he much preferred his guests embalmed, where he would have them dressed up on display, just as they were before making the mistake of crossing Ferdinand. Now, what's the point of having that hardcore collection if you're not going to show it off? Well, he did. To the people he suspected of treason, which in a place like that, treason leaves your mind pretty quick. Number 2. Average Height for the Time Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military strategists of his time, maybe of all time. With full support of the French army, Napoleon found himself earning gallant victories one after another, all being accomplished at a very young age. However, after years of grand success in multiple wars and kicking a lot of imperial butt, it started to go to his head. Shortly after the coup that overthrew Robespierre, Napoleon had gained enough support to claim himself as the Emperor of France. With said power, dissolved the freedom of press, reduced the rights of women, and oh yeah, he was at war with most of Europe for years to come. While his military victories cannot be understated, his rise as a tyrannical dictator makes him very unholy. Number 1. Dracula There's been a lot of unholy things said here today, but old Vladdy takes the cake. What he lacked in land and power, he made up for in his brutality. As the legends go, Vlad was creative in his punishments, and was well noted for his human art pieces. And by art, I mean impaling his enemy on pikes. 
sometimes to their rear ends, and leaving them as warnings for anyone who dared cross him. Similar to the time visiting envoys wouldn't remove their hats as it is to do in tradition, so Vlad had their hats nailed to their skulls so that they may never remove them. There are a few other stories that are just too hot for YouTube, but I think he's a textbook example of unholy. He may also be the inspiration for Dracula. Imagine being that much of a monster one is created in your likeness. I mean, just looking at the painting of this guy it creeps me out, man. Whoa. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later. But Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. And we'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number eight, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen of Ireland. Pirate queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There, she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones' locker with a legendary ferocity. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530, around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused, and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess. And not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7. Lovers Touch Some couples flourish, others fizzle out. Some keep their privacy and others like to make out in the hallways, right in front of everyone. Yeah, you know the ones. It's always by a classroom you have to walk by, or it's by your locker. Joanna of Castile leans more towards awkward locker makeouts. It's speculated that she may have had some form of mental illness. After her mother fell ill, she was reported not to be eating or sleeping, which doesn't sound that bad, actually. She was also a very envious person who oftentimes expressed her distaste for her husband's mistresses, reportedly attacking one on occasion, which again, doesn't sound that bad. And when her husband died of illness, she kept very close to the man's body and traveled over 600 kilometers with it, where he was to be buried, where she would often open the casket and embrace the cadaver and kiss him. Oh, okay, that's where the unholiness is, gotcha. I know medical knowledge wasn't great, but if your husband died of an illness, you couldn't seriously think that kissing him was a good idea. This is like the third royal I've come across that has a fixation on corpses. Sometimes you just gotta let the dead be dead, man. Number six, who are you gonna call? Queen Maria I of Portugal might have actually been insane. And no, not like, come on down to my local car dealership, these prices are insane. More like the Joker on a magic white powder that shan't be named just in case. I don't want to make you too big angie. She was known for ranting and raving, screaming that she had been damned. Perhaps it was phantoms of the night demonizing the poor soul. In attempts to cure her madness, such advanced scientific treatments like bloodletting and enemas were tried in order to cure her. The enema kind of makes sense. Maybe she's a little blocked up. It happens. I don't know. There were other attempts to cure her of her madness, but nothing seemed to work. While her first years in power were good, 
No one was ready for what they got afterwards. Hi, yes, uh, I'm calling from the royal court. We think the queen needs an exorcism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we tried that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we tried that too. Yes, and we did try the uh, tried and true method of animal, yes. How soon can you get here? Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. Yes, I am available between the hours of 8 to 5. Mm-hmm. Number 5. A2 Brute. Agrippina of Rome was like many mothers, in the sense that she would do anything for her kids. I'm sure every mom at home watching would scheme and slaughter their way through Roman nobility in order for her son to become emperor, right? I mean, come on, it's for the family after all. She only did it a few times, and sees the wealth of nobles which further solidified her powerful position. And her son, her beautiful baby boy Nero. How did the young lad return the favor of all this bloodthirst and treachery? Like mother, like son. Chose to fatally remove her of her power. What a nice family story right there. My mom usually just makes turkey with the stuffing, but maybe I can ask for the Roman throne this Christmas. Mom! Number 4. Revenge Boudicca was the wife of a man who had spent his time serving the Roman Empire. So when a deal was altered Darth Vader style by the Romans over what would happen to her husband's kingdom, she was pissed. Karen pissed. To be fair, she did have a point. They did unsavory and unholy things to her and her daughters. Plus, the Romans totally lied about not annexing their kingdom. Okay, so now it was time for some revenge. She gathered all the people she could and went on the attack. The Romans surprisingly did not fare that well. Boudicca was having such good luck she decided to burn London down. Of course, no civilians were harmed in the process. <laughs> I'm just kidding, a lot of people probably didn't do too well as humans can't live in fire. Sure, she was owed some revenge, but burning down a whole city? That's a lot. The Romans did eventually catch up, and she was forced to drink poison in order to avoid capture. She is remembered as somewhat of a hero to some. Number 3. Girl Power Tamar of Georgia was a woman who didn't take kindly to men questioning the rule of a woman. As you would wind up dead. She is, no she is noted for having a hand in the Golden Age of Georgia. Funny enough, she was made a saint even though she vanquished all the orthodox clergymen at the time, for also questioning her rule. Her husband aided in conquering more land, but when he couldn't keep it in his pants, she banished him and remarried. You go girl, you commit acts of unholiness and stand up for yourself. Number 2. Serial Killer Daria Saltkova was not necessarily a queen, but she was Russian nobility. She had strong connections with the royal court and other Russian nobility. She was also very unholy. Now, Maybe you can blame it on her being widowed. Maybe she's just crazy. But her actions were sadistic. She's noted for having severely tormented her serfs and would straight up just kill them, with numbers reaching at least 138. At first, complaints about family members disappearing after working for her royal nightmare were ignored. She was just too powerful and connected. Eventually, a petition was put together and shown to Catherine the Great, where it was decided Daria would be tried publicly. She spent one hour in a public space in Moscow where people scorned her for her crimes. She was then sentenced to prison where the rest of her days were spent. She is also at times compared to Elizabeth Bathory, who committed similar non-nightmare inducing crimes. Just kidding, they were an absolute nightmare. Number 1. Her Royalness Queen Elizabeth II Queen Elizabeth II may be the modern Queen of England, but that does not make her free of controversy and unholiness. If you are to believe in conspiracy theories, then perhaps old Blighty had a hand in a few things that to a normal person would be considered immoral. The death of Princess Diana immediately comes to mind, as there is some evidence to suggest the family is behind it, and her being the queen and all, it's easy to make the connection. But perhaps the most unholy crime ever committed, apparently the queen likes her sandwiches with the crust cut off. Imagine all the extra time needed to trim the crust off every sandwich. I want to talk to HR just thinking about all the extra work. But maybe you can cut the crust off of mine? Um, don't tell anyone though. Okay, thanks. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games, and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings, back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests, and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something, and he would hold weddings for them, and even hold lavish funerals.
funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage, and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number 9. Banning Coffee This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad the Fourth, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not going to know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why are you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number 7, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband the Dauphin of France died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband she loved until he became a drunkard and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. 
And, but it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, Queen Isabella I. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegun of Soissons. Okay, maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild, who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right, technically not a queen, I get it, but she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed, but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number two, Catherine de' Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible, so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father, Henry VIII, ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having de legitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. Yeah.